Hello and a warm welcome to our special program coming to you from the campus of Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore. Management studies are one of the most sought after courses in the country and if you happen to be a student of IIM, people say that life and the prospects are totally different. What is the general scenario of the management education in the 21st century? What are the challenges and what's the road ahead? Joining me now is a bright set of students from the first year, second year and the doctoral courses and also on my left and right are two brilliant faculty members. On my right is uh, Professor Saurav Mukherjee, he's the Dean of Programs and on my left is Professor N. Sabrinathan who's the Professor in Finance and he's also the head of the Entrepreneurship Center. You'll have to answer a lot of questions, Professor. Sure. <laughs> Welcome all of you on this special program. Uh, let me begin by uh, you, uh, Professor Saurav. Uh, what do you exactly do with the students on the campus of IIM in two years that they turn out to be jewels and they join as raw people? What do you actually do with them in the, in the two years program? Yeah, I think we would be taking too much of a credit if we say that we do a lot of things to them. I think the, the selection process is such that we get very bright students to start with. Okay. And then, of course, uh, what we try to do is to give them a very broad understanding of different kinds of businesses which happen. Okay. So that's the knowledge part. We hopefully try to give them some things about skills in trying to, you know, how to understand people behavior, how to build networks, etc. And then maybe a little bit about attitude that, you know, how do you deal with time? How do you deal with pressure? How do you be very socially sensitive? So if you are able to do these three things, then I think, you know, they become a little better than what they already were. Let me get in uh, Professor Sabrinathan's uh, view also before I go to the students. Uh, what according to you is the USP of the IM students? And also the IM faculty as well, because they are the ones who are nurturing the leadership in the country. I think from the student side, I think we are very lucky to get some of the brightest people into the campus. And as, okay. I think as Professor Saro mentioned, uh, it would be wrong on our part to take entire, the entire credit for the kind of people we turn out. I think it's a lot of the, the raw, raw material, if I may use that term, is itself of a, of a very high quality. So it's when you when the material you have is of a high quality, it's easy to mold it also to very high standards. And as faculty, we are sensitive of the, about the fact that we are dealing with extraordinarily bright students. So okay. the way we develop the curriculum, the way we keep revising the curriculum from time to time, one of the things we I hope we'll get to talk about as we go along is how we introduce something which probably no other business school so has done. So the faculty is, is equally on the toes yes. like the students. Yeah, yeah, it's not easy being a faculty here. Okay, <laughs> that's an honest uh, confession. Let me go down to a few students now. Uh, if I were to ask you, what's your name? My name is Ankur. Ankur, you're from, uh, from the first year, right? Yes. Okay, uh, honestly tell us, you know, people on the streets, a common man generally has a perception of the IIM students that they never get to sleep. What is the number, the number of hours of sleep you actually have? So that vary according uh, during the semester. So in the beginning, the co when the courses start, usually we able to get six to seven hours of sleep. But as you progress around the semester, as the exams come, as the quizzes come, it boils, it comes down to three hours also daily. Three hours. He's smiling. I think he has something else to say. What is your honest uh, admission of the number of hours you put? No, so, so generally what I do is that if I'm not able to get, say, hours of sleep in the night, so let's say two hours only, I, gen uh, I tend to sleep in the afternoon. So it's not that bad, but yeah, as a semester or the or the course pressure builds up, sometimes we have less hours of sleep in the night as well. Just raise your hands also. Uh, you also have a mic this side, no? Okay, yes. Uh, you're from the doctoral course, right? No, I'm from PGPPM. PGPPM. Uh, what is your actual routine, you know, uh, in terms of the syllabus and the courses you're following? What What is the life for you at, on the campus? What time do you really get up? What time do you sleep? Or uh, what, what is the duration of your classes? In the beginning semester, we have eight to eight classes. Then we have a lot of assignments. Then uh, we come examinations and all. Okay. So we have to work very hard. And uh, usually we get four to five hours sleep when we have a first semester. People, people generally, people also say that you're working hard, but working hardly as well. So <laughs> is, is that true? <laughs> is that true? Yes. So uh, also it depends on how many case competitions and all you take part in. So if you're a person who takes part in club competitions, and if you're in a part of a club, so there are a lot of clubs here, like Calcom and other clubs. So if you are a part of a club, then essentially your routine will be more uh, stretched. So then you may have to compromise on sleep if you want to be at all. But uh, Professor Saurabh, uh, there are a lot of other business schools as well. You have 19 campuses of IIM and uh, government keeps announcing one or two new ones every year during the budget time. So uh, how do you really differentiate IIM from the other business schools? They are also giving in management education. Obviously the faculty and the 
the quality is very different. But what is the actual clincher of an IIM campus? No, certainly the, <clears throat> the quality of faculty. Okay. I, I would say that there it's a lot of difference between, say, the top 20 business schools of the country and the rest. Uh, largely because I think the top business schools in the country are very focused on research. Okay. And we strongly believe that we cannot be good teachers in class if we don't do relevant research. Uh, I don't know whether such a stress is there in other business schools in the country. Okay. That's one. The other thing which I might say is infrastructure. I mean, given that we have a lot of experience going, uh, we probably have now got a good sense that what's the kind of infrastructure that is conducive to learning. And here right. I'm not talking about AC rooms or you know very expensive playgrounds, but we are just saying that what's the infrastructure that helps students to you know interact with one another. But when you talk about the IM infrastructure, what are your real pointers at? Are you are you talking about the digital classrooms? You're talking about uh, what what kind of infrastructure really comes to your mind? <clears throat> no, definitely the IT, the technology part is today playing a big role. Okay. But if you just walk into a classroom in IIM, IIM Bangalore, you will see that it is very conducive to case study discussions. Okay. I mean, even the structure of the classroom is very different from a traditional college or a traditional school. Okay. Now, starting from that position to saying that, and, and some of this we are learning over years, we are now creating a lot of discussion rooms for the students. So we okay. are saying uh, typically so a faculty is that, member. is that a new concept of the discussion rooms you're talking about? Is that a new concept? I would say relatively new. I mean, we are learning from the best practices all over the world. Okay. But the need of it, I think we are feeling a lot more now. Yeah, someone here wants to say something, yes? I would like to add, you know, we have also started having an integrated mode of learning in some of the courses, wherein, you know, we have videos where we learn the concepts before the class itself, okay. and we have a lot of class time for discussions on real-world examples and scenarios. Okay. So, you, that's something new that we have started in some of our courses. Okay. Uh, but a uh, lot of uh, the students have uh, finished their first internship, or they are going to be uh, going for the internships, right? So what has been your experience so far of what you have learned and now how you're going to put, it, put your experiences into the industry? What, what, what does your experience say? You, you... Okay, uh, I can add a point here. Uh, the thing is when we were talking about discussions, uh, half of the learning happens in class where you learn the concepts. But most of it happens in terms of discussions. As we discussed earlier, we are a bright set of students. I, I claim <laughs> I'm happy to take the credit from our professors so... themselves. But having said that, when you discuss on a project or on a case, that is when the real learning happens because it's not just your output, it's also others' output which integrates into create a synergy. And uh, that's where real learning happens. And this is what helps us in our internships where we deal with the practical world. But uh, Professor Sabrinathan, if I were to ask you, uh, there is a general perception that uh, there's a lot of theory and you know the, the analytical part is missing. There's a lot of theory, case-based studies, of course you're doing, but still the larger, uh, the driving factor is the theory part. Would you, would you really agree? Surely as there is the theory, IMK but there is a good reason for uh, putting in theory. I mean, it's all about, you know, uh, putting some, someone through a technical school versus putting somebody through an engineering college. Mm. When you put somebody through an engineering college, you're equipping him to have a longer shelf life as a professional in terms of designing things ground up to ask fundamental questions. When you go through a pure technical school, you learn to maintain stuff or you learn to drive stuff or whatever. So that's the, so we are, when you prepare somebody for a 10, 15 year haul in industry to be a, an effective manager. You need to equip him or her with the ability to think and that's what theory does. It helps you understand phenomena, it helps you think. So I think theory is inevitable. The question is how do you help people understand the theory in a real world connect and that's where I think going back to the point that Saro made, the faculty make a lot of difference in building that bridge between theory and practice. But Professor Saurabh, uh, IIMs also have evolved, you know. Uh, after the independence, when the economy was growing at a very slow pace and the management focus was really on the, the bureaucratic management. Now the, sh uh, now the entire thing is shifting to an entrepreneurship management and you know other kinds of management to more diverse fields. Uh, how would you really encapsulate that evolution over the years and what is that one aspect now probably which you would want to focus on? Well, so I think I am Bangalore is a great example of that because, you know, till early 90s, we were a school which was focused on managing public services. You know, okay. we, we, were, we were created to some extent to say that how do we create managers in the government sector? And with liberalization, we thought that, you know, that's not the only thing where we should focus on. And we have evolved into saying that how can we create managers and leaders for the corporate world? And I think in the last few years and Professor Sabrina Is it because of overemphasis on the corporate world that now IMs only offer a corporate internship? Is it true? You can correct mm. me if I'm wrong. Yes, I, I think he wants to say something. Yes, go ahead. 
I really found ki they are really focused on the social issues also. It's not only corporates. Okay. Because we find lot many corporate cases and the, as well as the social cases also where our professor has really worked hard. And some of the th uh, very eye opener uh, examples, they have a, uh, revealing facts are there which really open our eyes ki how it is affecting our day to day lives. But what happens if you don't want to uh, go in for a corporate internship? Do you have an option like that? Yes? Not about the internship, but I'm talking about a social entrepreneurship summit which was, which was conducted at IIM Bangalore recently. And we had people from various sectors, from the educational sector, from the, the healthcare sector, from the energy sector, talking to us and helping, you know, telling us how to go ahead and have an entrepreneurial, social entrepreneurial uh, career ahead. And they were alums of IIM. So it's not like the IIM guys don't enter the social entrepreneurship space. They do. But uh, amongst this crowd, how many of you are from the engineering background? Let me, let me, let me see. Oh my God, that's eighty percent of it. <laughs> but uh, I think this is the biggest challenge, uh, Professor Sabrinathan, that uh, most of the people coming to the campuses of IIMs are from the engineering background. How do you really break this homogeneity of the campus? That's a crucial question at the moment. I think it's more a reflection of how the society uh, sends people to school these days. Okay. In my generation, there were very few engineering colleges. If you didn't go to one of the engineering colleges, you would do a sciences course, right? Today, there are so many engineering colleges that nobody is really having to turn to a sciences course unless one has an inclination to do commerce or economics. So I think what was, let's say, a BSc 25, 30 years back is now a BTEC or a BE. So which is why you find so many quote unquote engineers. If you hadn't had so many engineering colleges, you'd probably have seen more physicists, more chemists and so on. But I think 10 years from now, that would have changed again. The wheel is turning full circle because of institutions like IISCR and so on. Science is becoming more, uh, you know, contemporary and so right. on. I think, so I think it's a larger social thing. It has got nothing to do with the IIMs alone. You take any cross-section, I think you'll find this. But uh, Professor Saurabh, is it a tougher task for the faculty also to handle the students who are coming from the non-engineering backgrounds? Uh, is it a tougher task for you? Because you also have a particular template in your mind, you know, by which you filter the students, you nurture them, and suddenly you find someone who's from a non-engineering background. Is, does that become a challenge for the faculty as well? Okay, so I teach organization behavior. Okay. And, and for me, the engineers are the bigger challenge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, behavior is something which is not black and white. I mean, okay. it's sociology. And the biggest thing, I think, the only lesson probably which I would like to give to my students is, now don't look at the world as black and white. I mean, okay. don't expect a QED at the end of a problem. I mean, problems have different ways to look for. But I'm sure that for a finance faculty, maybe the non-engineers might pose a little bit of challenge because right. they would have not got in touch with maths for a while. So, yeah. I have oh, yes. one thing to add. I'm yes. a medical doctor myself. Okay, I'm doing lovely. a one-year residential. I was, in fact, I was about to ask that question. What happens if an MBBS doctor lands yeah, up in the campus? Uh, the thing is that I had my uh, little bit of challenging turns when I came to a quantitative skills because I was away from them for a couple of years. But it is a matter of time when we pick up. But of course, I have edge at other places where I can add value a diverse po point of view. Why when did you think of uh, taking up management? It's, uh, it's all the way you develop a career and perspective throughout the years. I felt that I am a good clinician, but I am also better at looking at the things in a holistic perspective for a system engineering kind of thing. So it w that was the primary motivation to come into an IAM and basically, you know, it was a dream. Okay. But uh, yes, you want to add something? Give her the mic, please. Uh, so on that note, I think engineers do have some benefits at the same time. Students from other backgrounds also do very well in some courses. For example, my friends who have done uh, who have done the chartered who are chartered accountants, we go to help we go go to them for help. For example, in finance courses or things like that, and they come they come for help to us in quant course quant related courses. So it's basically a mix. It's it's just the diversity that has and we help each other so we have been so we have plus cultural and backgrounds and cross curriculum backgrounds also help a lot okay but uh, yes you want to add Give, give him the mic, give him the mic, please. Yes. I just have to add one thing, uh, that we also have preparatory classes here before the actual course begins. So uh, they are given basic training about uh, computers, English, uh, uh, basic quant accounting, so that most of the students when they start their coursework are to some extent aware about what is going on. So that is 21 days of pre preparatory course actually help uh, a lot of you, you You spoke about uh, English language. Do you also have students, Professor Saurav, coming in who, who cannot speak English? That would be hardly, no? 
Yeah, no, I think certainly we might not have somebody who just cannot speak English, but okay. the ability to communicate varies quite a lot. Okay. And I must tell you, engineers are not the best communicators. Yeah. So even our <laughs> smartest of students might not be great communicators. To, so we do have courses on communication built into the curriculum. I think students on their own also are members of Toastmasters Club. We take the help of our alumni to come and tell us how to communicate in the industry, etc. So that's an area which we are focusing on and we can certainly do a lot in that area. But uh, another uh, uh, point, you know, which, which, which the parents uh, who are wanting to send their students to the IIM, they talk about the, the exorbitant fee, the annual fee which you have to pay. What, what is the, what, let me ask a few students, how much are you really paying really as a tuition fee? Yes? So we have a tuition fee of close to 19 lakhs, but if you look at the kind of options that are available, we have a lot of education loans and that to it interest rates which are less than the market rate. So we do have options in terms of uh, loans being available to us. So I don't think fees as such is a problem to get an admission into IIM Bangalore. So you, we can easily say that even a chaiwala from a small village can aspire to be on the IIM campus? Yeah. Professor Yes, yeah. yeah, sure. I mean, uh, definitely the answer is yes. But I must say that we, we, I mean, through people like you, I think we should spread this message more that although the fee is high, there are enough possibilities of getting loans and, and financial aid. Uh, for students who come from economically underprivileged background, the school provides aid, financial aid. Okay. Uh, so definitely true, but I certainly think we can do a much better job of spreading this message that IIMs are not a hindrance to do education if you don't have the money. I mean, that's the last thing that should be a hindrance in our country. Okay. Now, let me ask a few students more. You know, gender inequality is also a point which is, which is harped upon a lot on the campuses of IIM, mean, and for that matter, even in the engineering colleges. Uh, what do you have to say? How do you, how do you react to the gender inequality? I think, uh, for starters, considering the fact that I am... You You're from the first year, no? I'm from the first year, yes. Okay. So we are postgraduate programs. You don't get to see so many girls on the it's campus. It's about 25%, <laughs> I guess, is the ratio here. Uh, so it's, it's a general trend. I mean, we see that in education in India. So as you go up higher, uh, the ratio of women keep dropping down. So I think it's not specific to IMs. Uh, you go back to engineering, I think it's even worse, the gender ratio there. So it's kind of getting better here. And a lot of schools have, uh, you know, they give marks for gender diversity. I know... Um, Calcutta, K, Kodi uh, Code, and Indore also do. So I think there is a bit of that extra push that is given. Uh, but I think this is the face of society that we have today. I think we'll have to live with it and maybe hope that it gets better. But uh, Professor Sabri Nathan, how is, how, how is the faculty really or the management uh, of the IIM campus per se dealing with this gender inequality bit? We, we see just about 25% of the girls on the campus, rest of them so I think uh, while uh, some of the other IIMs that he mentioned have a conscious policy, um, we don't state it as a conscious policy. But if you look at the numbers, our numbers are getting better year on year. So, uh, but so do you do you give some kind of concession to the girls, maybe at the interview stage, or? I, I think I mean I you know from a policy point of view, I don't think we do that, and I think the girls themselves would probably not okay. like it that way. I think they'd like to fight it on an on an equal turf. Okay. And the good news is that I think they're doing a damn good job of it. Okay. And inside the class, as a teacher, I see that they are, you know, with due respect to all the boys around here and <laughs> middle-aged man, so I can have my little predilections if you like. But I think they are doing, on average, better than the guys. Okay. And I think they would rather have it that way than have any quotas or allocations given to them. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, you want to say something? As a girl for this gender diversity um, issue, so we're 25% we're of us here. But I don't think that uh, does not give us a level playing field. We are fighting with the boys, doing the same okay. thing that they do. That's great. And <laughs> I don't think we're, I don't think that is a differentiating factor because we get the same opportunities, and we're just fighting it out the way everybody else does. So we don't fight on gender basis. We're all students here, so that helps. Okay. Uh, before we start talking about the entrepreneurship and you know the flagship programs of the current government like Make in India and Digital India. Uh, as students, what do you think is is is, is the biggest, uh, probably the aspect on which, as a student, you need to work on as long as you, you're, you're here in the campus of IIM? What is that one bit probably you would want to work an extra mile? So I think uh, one of the major aspects of our learning here is the projects that we do in terms of the peer learning that we have from the other students. And on that front, uh, 
so when you are participating in various competitions you are uh, to get an exposure to the actual world outside and to get the reality check that what what exactly is happening i think that's the biggest thing that we need to work on we take it as a challenge for us and so whenever we have a problem and we try to find solutions it should not be just inside the campus we should go out there face the real world and understand what exactly are the challenges and then propose any solutions to that accordingly now in the two year gadget program you are going for internships only once yes. do you think that the number of internships should increase by whatever experience you've had so far do you feel that the number of internships should increase anybody. yes anyone so anyone internship is not well, let him speak yes uh, yeah so from what i feel the interaction with corporates is not just limited to, uh, to the internships uh, all through your campus life you get to interact with uh, corporates uh, by being in the club so like we get approached by clubs multiple clubs as sponsors to our events or even the fest that we organize so the corporate interaction is at multiple levels it's the internship experience is a part of learning experience for sure but the way you uh, so learn about the, the corporate life throughout the two years you keep having interactions at various levels with the industry yeah actually a part of uh, important part of it is are the live projects actually okay so there are various startups when you say live projects what does that mean so there might be different firms who may want uh, uh students from i am bangalore to work, to help them in solving some of their business problems so they would actually reach out to us by means of these clubs and then our students will get an exposure to those real world problems as well as able to solve the problems for them so it's a win win situation for both and in this way we are also able to get some exposure apart from the internships per se uh professor sabrinathan uh, i am campus bangalore uh, boasts of its own kind of uh, incubation center just tell us a little about that and how does it really help students at the campus the incubation center so first of all uh, we are not the only campus that has an incubation center there are others too okay uh, but i think we are this is the oldest i believe yeah it's among the oldest and i think we are one of the few that has an endowment income which helps us do a lot of things that others can't and we are in bangalore so these are the three great advantages i keep talking about okay uh, we are an open incubation center which means that we are not confined or capital to our students we support entrepreneurs from the whole of the ecosystem in bangalore okay but i think the real so it's not only the students there are outsiders as well who are yes. working for the yes. okay who work who work out of the incubator but i think the real uh, you know i i call the incubation center and the entrepreneurship center our secret weapon and you will see the power of the secret weapon in the years to come because of a significant change that has been made in the curriculum okay. so starting next year we'll have entrepreneurship as a core course which is that every one of the 420 or 430 students will necessarily undergo a course in entrepreneurship in the first so year so do you mean that it comes as a special subject uh, throughout it is a subject years? by itself okay yeah it's a, like finance it's a like marketing like ob like accounting okay. it's a course okay right and so when you when you want to run a course like that effectively you need the support of an entrepreneurship center so okay. that that's why i call it a secret weapon okay so we we'll be able to do it perhaps a lot better than any other school that is the name of an entrepreneurship okay. center Let, sourcing projects industry contacts etc right sir let me share a few experiences with the students what has been your experience of working in the incubation centers you are you associated with that as well no but in uh, association with the incubation center we also have an entrepreneurship cell of student body that kind of organizes eximias the student fest of entrepreneurship and also various other initiatives to encourage entrepreneurship within campus some of them like they have started this initiative called b starters where they would themselves try to mentor 20 different entrepreneurs uh, uh, entrepreneur their attempts in the college itself for the students so we have this building up this ecosystem is building up in campus where even students are taking up initiatives towards entrepreneurship but uh, professor sorab with uh, the high decibel campaign on flag, uh, flagship programs like make in india then uh, digital india swachh bharat uh do you think that earlier governments have never given that kind of a push what modi modi is uh, giving yes. are you in a position to say that this is the first kind of its push uh, you know which which any government so far has given yeah possibly yes and i think uh, the 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 role of a policy maker is to what we call give the direction and give the nudges okay and it's for us to embrace it and and do it in the best way possible so in that sense i think they are giving all the right kind of signals and it's for us and our students to say okay how do we do the nuts and bolts the nitty gritties because all of these have huge challenges associated with that so what is the biggest uh, i mean uh, how would the students look at the biggest challenge at the moment uh, yes give him the mic so for us the so uh, for us the biggest challenge is like uh, 
uh, how effectively we can utilize the whole two years from here and we can implement the thing implement the learnings in different different sectors and different perspectives and we are very well being equipped for that in the campus and as far as uh, building the entrepreneurial uh, spirit is concerned what probably would be the road ahead professor sora see the what professor sabrinathan talked about i know we realized that entrepreneurship cannot be taught in a class so we are trying to do, and this is an experiment for us we saying yes we will have classroom based inputs but probably for the first time we will run a course which will be absolutely applied in nature which will probably have involvement of industry mentors a lot more than our own faculty members our faculty members would largely play the role of facilitators and guides but in this course of uh, things does the faculty also get an opportunity to innovate to build its own entrepreneurial spirit because there's not too much of mobility as we see in universities like wharton and harvard yeah. there's not too much of mobility within the faculty so do you also really get to innovate and try and experiment new things along with the students innovate as an academician sure will that make me go and start my own business i don't know maybe i'm not at all good at that so you know. okay <laughs> <laughs> because it reminds me of the titan ad where where the student appoints uh, his own faculty member as one of the faculty members as uh, as uh, the ceo of the company happy to do that role yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much for uh, for coming here on this program you're really running short of time so that's it from me on this episode goodbye and thanks for watching